Mark Rogers, TV Talk on Ohio State football. We bring in Tony Gerdeman from theozone.net. Please join him there for the very best in Ohio State football coverage. Uh, Tony, I believe the last time we had you on was just uh, after the Wisconsin game for the Big Ten Championship prior to the Cotton Bowl. And so before we talk about current news, just your thoughts about uh, the performance in the Cotton Bowl. I guess it can be looked at in two separate ways. It's difficult to get around that Ohio State's offensive and defensive lines dominated in the trenches. I guess uh, taking the negative view would be, okay, they capitalized on some some um, USC turnovers, sat on a 17-0 lead, did little offensively. The other thought could be they didn't need to do much, and they took advantage and dominated a top-10 team. I think that's it. You know, um, Urban Meyer was really wanted this win. And when they had that, you know, 17 point lead, he didn't really want to do anything to risk that. So they pretty much shut it down in the second half because they knew the USC offense wasn't going to do anything, you know, to that defense, to the Ohio State defense. And basically he wanted to end this season as positively as he could with wins because you don't make the playoffs, but you beat Michigan, you win the Big Ten title. And he really wanted this bowl win for the seniors. Because that's one of the things, uh, one of the criticisms of JT Barrett was that he wasn't getting the team to ho hoist any trophies. So this was a big thing for Meyer to let these guys end on a good note because he knows a lot of people won't look at it as positively as maybe they should. And with the win over USC and the Cotton Bowl, a significant team, a significant bowl, uh, it allowed them to cap it. Well, which will be remembered down the line, you know, at the at the time, twenty four seven, the offense wasn't couldn't run the ball. You know, they didn't look all that great, but five years from now, it's a win in the Cotton Bowl over USC, and you don't really think about how they looked in the second half. And it's a number five final ranking, which uh, prior to the college football playoff would have been viewed differently by different uh, people depending on your viewpoint. There's almost a set viewpoint uh, these days. If you look at the number five position after the season, it signifies that you just missed the playoff and the magic number is four. Uh, it, it's still a remarkable achievement, especially when you consider uh, the Big Ten championship in hand in what is possibly the toughest conference in college football. I'm going to rank them soon when I run the metrics of the games. Uh, it was brought to my attention again in watching some of the, um, some of the tributes to Keith Jackson and how many times he referred to and, and watching some of the Ohio State Michigan opens and watching just uh, in general college football uh, mm -hmm. clips from Keith Jackson where he mentioned conference championship, conference championship, Big yeah. Ten championship, and the significance there. And I, I think it's just very unfortunate, Tony, that that's been lost uh, for a lot of people. I, I completely agree. And you, you think to um, the 2016 season, the Buckeyes made the playoffs. They lost 31 nothing in that first round. Which season would fans rather have? You know, the one where they make the playoffs or this past year where they win the Big Ten, they also beat Michigan, and they win their bowl game. I mean, there's there's really no comparison in terms of the high, you know, or what you've reached or um, maybe the enjoyment that fans got out of the season. But because they weren't in the playoffs, they maybe didn't appreciate the rest of it as, as much as they should have I completely agree about the big 10 championship or conference champions championships as a whole. And urban Meyer will tell you, that's what they set out to do at the start of the season. You want to win the big 10 because that opens up other things to you this time around. It didn't open up what they thought it would, you know, that loss to Iowa is never going to go away. And, and um, the committee, you know, it, it stuck out like a very sore thumb. But winning that Big Ten title is something that it's it's forever, and it used to mean I don't know if it used to mean more. It should still mean the same, uh, and it means the same to the coaches who have been around and fought for him for thirty years. You know, it means a lot to Urban Meyer. I mean, he remembers back in the eighties at Ohio State as a grad assistant, and he knows what it's like to to win the SEC. And um, you know, you only it's not easy to win a conference. And so when you accomplish it, you have to appreciate it as a program, as a team, and, and the fans need to as well, I think. 
Yeah, uh, it didn't work out this year in regards to the playoff. I still believe that, um, of course, uh, most of the time, four of the five conference championships uh, champions are going to make it to the playoffs. And, and I would think that out of the next 10 Big Ten champions, eight or 10, eight to nine to 10, something in that range will make it to the college football playoff. All right, on to 2018. And uh, teams are allowed to add a 10th coach to the coaching staff. Alex Grinch is the selection of Urban Meyer, defensive coordinator at Washington State. And if you don't know much about Washington State football, it's been upgraded tremendously uh, by Mike Leach in the win column. And much of that has to do not with the passing game, because that's pretty much always been there, although it's more efficient than it was uh, prior to Mike Leach. But in regards to defense, and Alex Grinch has taken it, a woeful defense, one of the worst in Power 5 football, one of the worst in the FBS, well, uh, as low in FBS football as 117 and made it respectable. So now you add Alex Grinch and what uh, he could bring to uh, an Ohio State defense that's obviously ultra-talented, Tony. Yeah, and I think when people first hear Washington State and defensive coordinator, they don't really get too excited. I had you know fans hitting me up on Twitter saying, you know, what's – why would Ohio State go after this guy? And this was just, just when he was rumored to be linked to Ohio State. And I would tell him, go look at the numbers. Go look at what he's done for their pass defense, pass efficiency defense. Because um, you, you never equate Washington State in it, probably history you know, to uh, stellar defense. But that's what they were able to do under Grinch. And um, that's what he'll do at Ohio State as well. You, you look at, like you said, the talent. They'll have NFL corners. NFL safeties, and this is a guy who has excelled in pass defense and building a pass defense, and that's something that Ohio State struggled at, struggled at, uh, at times this season. You look at the uh, Indiana game to start the season. You know um, they, they throw for over 400 yards. Baker Mayfield, you know, the second game of the season, he throws for 350 or whatever. So um, that that pass defense as a whole was an issue at times this year. Alex Grinch will. Um, Help that, and honestly, he was he was probably going to be the guy to take over for Greg Schiano, and then they would have to go get another assistant to be that tenth coach. But him as the tenth coach right now, they don't even have. Um, they said his responsibilities; they'd figure them out later. And this is one of those guys. It's sort of like recruiting. If you can get this, you know, immensely talented defensive tackle, you don't have room for him. You go get him, and you figure it out later. Like they went and, and got Alex Grinch in Ohio, and. From Mount Union, from Central Ohio, and then you figure out what you're going to do with them later. Absolutely, guys have specialties, but you get the 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 best minds and the best coaches and teachers in the room, and then you figure it out from there. They all know football, and they know people, and they know how to teach. Uh, red zone defense, yeah. uh, exceptional at Washington State last year. What that tells me is he knows how to teach situational football and get his guys ready for knowing. Uh, situations. Uh, maybe that's not something Ohio State excelled in uh, last year. But again, as Tony mentions, look at the metrics at Washington State and compare them, not just take them on face value, but compare them to prior to Alex Grinch. And it's remarkable. Uh, the Washington State defense was laughable, awful, just ba basically paper thin, uh, seven on seven drills kind of stuff. And then you look at it now and yes, they they had their couple letdowns a year, but they didn't have the personnel Ohio State does, right. and they performed extremely well uh, against a capable conference that throws the ball all over the place. All right, Tony, you mentioned personnel and mentioned the personnel being NFL uh, caliber in terms of talent coming back in 2018, and that's a standard of Urban Meyer. Uh, certainly, uh, Sam Hubbard moving on to the next level. Uh, of course, he came out uh, and, and finished with a bang uh, yeah. In that uh, Cotton Bowl really had a tremendous game. I believe three and a half tackles for loss. Uh, Denzel Ward, uh, last second decision, at least in, in being revealed to the rest of us, uh, not playing in the bowl game. And Jerome Baker, of course, moves on to the NFL as well. Those are the early enrollees. And then we've got uh, the senior class moving on as well. Just your thoughts about those personnel losses that uh, could sting a little bit and some of those reinforcements we'll see this fall. Yeah, those three early departures uh, were the three most likely and um, losing Sam Hubbard is um, big, but you still have Nick Bosa and Chase Young and Jonathan Cooper, who are all former five-star guys. And, and you're bringing in, you know, another uh, 
talented four-star defensive end. Denzel Ward is, is the tough guy because he might have been the best corner in the nation, and you're going to replace him with, you know, also talented players. Um, but that's when when you lose a guy like that, like when you lose a guy like Marshawn Lattimore, you know, it doesn't matter how good the guys are behind them; it's still a loss. Jerome Baker, he, he didn't have the season that he wanted to this year. I don't know. Um, it, it shouldn't be as difficult to replace his performance. But his ability on the football field to do any number of different things, you know, that might be the tough part to replace. But I, I think the biggest, the toughest replacement would probably be like Billy Price on the at center. Um, he's been there forever, you know, mostly as a guard. But then this past year, he was the nation's top center and won the Remington Trophy. So replacing him with either the guy who, you know, Brady Taylor, who has been the backup center for about three years behind both Pat Elfline and Billy Price, but he was never the next guy up. And so you don't know if he's the next guy up now or if they're going to move another guard over. And really, if there is, if they do end up going with another guard, it's it's going to be somebody who's never played center in a game. You know, they've taken snaps in practice, but both Price and Elfline had, had actual game experience before they moved to center at center. So that's going to be a difficult one. And then, of course, you know, we talk about JT Barrett and what he meant to the overall program of the team. And for all of his limitations, the one thing that I think Urban Meyer loved most about him, well, several things, but his toughness, his leadership, his teammates loved him. But on those short yardage plays where they would, um, you know, empty the backfield and send JT Barrett into the line with numbers advantage. But what Meyer loved is he, he was so good at finding that extra yard, finding that little, just that little crease that 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 they needed. And so I wonder how much they're going to miss that next year because if it's Dwayne Haskins, he's not like that. Um, if it's Joe Burrow, he's similar to that. But JT Bear was just really good at finding that extra little foot or two. And you look at the, the Michigan game in 2016. Um, you know, however you think it ha- you know, it ended up being, he got where he needed to be in the ref size. And he he did that, I don't know, 95% of the time. And, and if you now go to a quarterback who does it 60% of the time, that's going to be a drop-off. But will they make up for it by maybe stretching the field more through the passing game? So there, there's some guys that are going to have to be replaced. But, you know, Urban Meyer has been recruiting since 2012 at Ohio State to get that done. In reviewing the passing offense, Tony, it uh, makes me think and just um... – really appreciate how magical that fourth quarter was against Penn state because uh, the offense uh, in the passing game just continued after that to look a little clunky at times. And I'm not going to rest that all on JT Barrett. Uh, I think it was just a combination of a number of things and it never, uh, the, the numbers were great leading into the Penn state game against the likes of Rutgers, Nebraska mm-hmm. and, and the rest of them. But that Penn state game, and if JT could bottle that in regards to, and I know guys were making some plays for him, the line did a tremendous job, but man, he was slinging it and it just appeared as though the velocity went up like three or four miles an hour on the fastball. And he was just slicing that thing through windows that it just looked like uh, 2014 at 2.0, yeah. like an upgrade even from his best football. Yeah. And looking back to the, uh, the- Comparing that to Nick Saban pulling Jalen Hurts, and I, it got me wondering. Got a bunch of you know people who follow Ohio State football wondering, what if would Urban Meyer have done that? You know, pulled JT Barrett for Dwayne Haskins, but I don't think, and I, and I wrote about this. I don't think he ever really had the opportunity because the game where you would do it would be the Iowa game, and that was one week after the Penn State fourth quarter, and so Ohio State was down by fourteen points at halftime against Iowa. You're not going to pull him at that point because you just saw what he did against Penn state the week before. And so that was on everybody's, you know, that recency bias or whatever. I mean, it's those, that was, that happened. And so urban Meyer as attached and loyal as he is to JT Barrett, he's not going to bench him at that point for a 14 point halftime deficit. And it's, that's what's so bizarre, so puzzling, so I guess frustrating for the fan base is that sometimes you would get what you saw out of you know what you saw out of JT Barrett at Penn State, but 
for the most part, he was also what limited their ability to get over a Clemson or to, you know, every year towards the end of the season, the passing game would struggle with Barrett. You know, was it weather? Was it this? Was it that? It was consistently, it would downgrade. His completion percentage would drop. His yards would drop. And it was, you know, I think I wrote about this as well. That he took them as far as, as the offense could go. And I think that's sort of what frustrated fans is he couldn't take them over the hump. Tony Gerdeman with us uh, to talk Ohio State football. You can join him at the ozone.net for the very best in Ohio State football coverage and some tremendous insight into the Buckeyes as they plan for 2018. Uh, Tony, in watching the NFL playoffs over the past few weekends, it uh, certainly in watching the Saints yesterday, you talk about a team that's loaded up on Buckeyes and benefited from it. In particular, uh, it got me to thinking, okay, I, Obviously, by any measurement, Ohio State football in just about any given year is going to do extremely well in uh, stacking up against other schools across the nation in terms of NFL talent, both quantity and quality. Uh, so I started to run some numbers. I'm going to do a series here that's going to be pretty exhaustive. And, and I'm looking at uh, that Saints game, and I see Ted Ginn and Michael Thomas, who has just burst onto the NFL. Mm -hmm. saw an interesting stat, Tony. 195-plus catches for Michael Thomas his first two years, 2,300 yards. That is the best performance for any two-year wide receiver in the history of the league. Uh, Ted Ginn just seems to get better as he gets yeah. older and, and maintains the speed. He's still a deep threat at 32. Um and uh, Marshawn Lattimore taking over as one of the best cover corners instantly in the NFL. And Von Bell, uh, an impact player for the Saints. And that's just the Saints. Uh, just your thoughts on watching the NFL playoffs. And, and in particular, that 2015 bunch with Zeke Elliott and Joey Bosa instantly becoming rookies of the year offense and defense mm -hmm. uh, the very first year in the NFL. And just uh, the Urban Meyer pipeline into the NFL and how successful it's been. It's it's been pretty amazing, and you think they'll have uh, what back to back defensive rookies of the year with Joey Bosa and Marshawn Lattimore, and you know some of these are Ohio guys like Lattimore, and but for the most part, for a lot of it, it's it's Urban Meyer going around the nation to get the best players in the nation. Like Von Bell was a five star guy out of the Tennessee Georgia area. Joey Bosa, who was from Florida, even though he had an Ohio State connection, and that his um like uncle was, was a former buckeye you know michael thomas was a california guy who actually committed to jim trestle and luke fickle and then went to um i believe fork union to uh play with cardale jones for a year before they all came to ohio state so it's the the number of players impact players in the nfl has gone up with the with Urban Meyer coming to Ohio State. That was one of the criticisms at the end of Jim Trestle's tenure was that the number of NFL players was diminishing. But this is something that you know, Urban Meyer has preached. It's what he sells at Ohio State. And, um, you know, that's why he can't get too upset if uh, Denzel Ward decides he doesn't want to play in a bowl game because this is, you know, the NFL is part of the promise. It's – if that's what you're going to sell, you can't be too upset when players buy it. And the way they're cranking out players to the NFL, it's just going to keep, um, you know, it's, it just rejuvenates itself. And really there's like, cause right now you've got two cornerbacks who were red shirt sophomores this year. The plan is for them to come back and then leave next year as red shirt juniors with, you know, el eligibility still remaining. You look at the, um, you know, with Mike Weber, he could have come out this year. He would have had he been the starter all year. Um, and it's just not that they're trying to push players in and out, but the more you get in and you get them to the NFL, it just sells the program even more. It lets uh, recruits see that it only, may only take me three years. And with, with a guy like Marshawn Lattimore, who redshirted as a, a true freshman because he was injured, his redshirt freshman season, he was injured. He had one healthy season at Ohio State, but it was enough. And look at him now. So it also lets players know that you may sit for a little bit, but that one opportunity you get is all that you need because you're going to be seen. And if you start at any position at Ohio State, that should guarantee you um, 
an NFL opportunity. So it's very highly competitive as well because of what it means in the future. Marshawn Lattimore, similar to the Malik Hooks, Hooker story from that standpoint in regards to getting the one chance after uh, sitting out and, af- uh, and actually contemplating leaving Ohio State. Uh, Tony Gerdemans all over the Buckeyes, uh, covers them each and every day throughout the offseason, right there at practice, in the news conferences, and talking to the players. So join him on the Ozone. And uh, I'm going to spare us a little bit of grief, Tony, when you mentioned that the John Cooper uh, NFL pipeline was dwindling at the end of his tenure. It certainly was. But Tony and I were talking prior yeah. uh, to, to recording about setting up that 2002 national championship game uh, team and uh, uh, us both being very aware of the talent on both sides of the ball. Michael Jenkins, Chris Gamble, uh, even Craig Krenzel at quarterback uh, lasted five or six years in the NFL with the Bears and the Giants. The offensive line was set. Uh, the defensive line, Kenny Peterson, Tim Anderson. We could go on Will and Smith. on. C. Grant at linebacker. Donnie Nicky in the secondary played with the Chargers and on and on. Of course, Dustin Fox, uh, like a third rounder with Minnesota. And yes, guys we're not naming that we're well aware of, uh, uh, so forth and so on. Matt Wilhelm played in the league. Yep. On and on and on and on. So uh, yeah, Tony and I, well aware of that uh, John Cooper pipeline to the NFL as well. Tony, we appreciate the breakdown, uh, and thanks for stopping by. Anytime. Thank you.